26, verses 24 through 35. It's found on page 755 in the Pew Bible. If you'd like to follow me along there. Contextually, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. So I'll be starting with verse 24. I'll be reading for the NRSV, so it's going to read a little different than the Pew Bibles. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they looked. They themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that will endure for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent you, whom he has sent. So they said to him, What signs are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe in you? What works are you performing? Our ancient ancestors ate the manna, from the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and which gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. And, um, let me once again say what a uh, pleasure it is to be with you in worship. Trinity United Methodist Church. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to uh, uh, once again share the word with you and to Pastor Amy for inviting me to come here and be with you. Before I share my word, let me just do a very brief commercial on my way. I've kind of been on a tour of southern and eastern New Mexico from my home in Lubbock here for the last three days. Um, it was my pleasure to be at our Sacramento Methodist Camp. It's now known as Sacramento Camp and Conference Center as a way to emphasize that its, its ministry is ecumenical and inter-church and not just focused among the uh, Methodists of New Mexico and West Texas anymore. But in fact, when I was there, I saw groups from the, Met the church in Wolforth, Texas, uh, groups from uh, Holloman Air Force Base, as well as some individuals from Fort Bliss uh, in El Paso. Holloman Air Force Base, of course, in Alamo Gordo. But the occasion for being there was the opening of the first unit of their designed Family Life Center, which is, uh, if any of you know the camp, I know many of you have been to the camp. It's the building that's just a little bit, what would it be? A little bit to the southeast of the dining hall where there used to be the old education building and they tore it down and are building a beautiful family life center and they've completed the first unit and uh, have two more uh, units to go a gathering room in the, in the middle and then another wing of the family life center and then on top of that we had a dinner in which we uh, uh, looked at the new family life center on Friday night and then yesterday they celebrated Sacramento's 90th birthday, 90 years, a fellow named Brian Skipper Hall, it was his vision. Uh, some of you may remember if you were youth uh, being with uh, Skipper Hall and so many others. Um, it's a wonderful ministry. It's uh, kind of well hidden. You go to Mayhill and then hang a left. And, uh, but my family, I'm so, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that my family's been going there since before I was born. Uh, so I was raised in 
First Methodist Church in Hobbs, and the church in Hobbs had a long, long relationship with Sacramento, and still does. And if, if any of you would like more information about Sacramento, I came back with some brochures. You know, you can't be a Methodist preacher without having a bunch of brochures wherever you go. So, and I put some out in the foyer, and I invite you to uh, go on the webpage and find out more about the continuing ministry of Sacramento Camp and Conference Center. I want to talk about the reading from Ephesians. Ephesians, in a way, is a, is a God's eye view of the plan of salvation. How presumptuous would it be of the writer of Ephesians? It might have been Paul. It might have been one of Paul's disciples or followers to think that he or she could look down from on heaven and see the beauty and the mystery of God's plan. Only someone who uh, had experienced that kind of heavenly grace could do that. But in this plan, the mystery is that God wants to gather all things into one. And in order to do that, took the ministry of Christ. You remember that old song that said one is the loneliest number? Could God have felt that way? Alone? We believe in the oneness of God. And so God decided to uh, invite His Son into this world so He could experience what it meant to live in nature, to live among human beings, some friends, some enemies, some indifferent, and to humble himself before us and to choose God's will in the midst of human will. That's the mystery of the cross, isn't it? The mystery of the vertical dimension the divine presence and the horizontal dimension. The divine presence among humanity. And in the midst of that, as a result of Christ's will, Christ's ministry and the cross, Christ ascended and brought us with him. To create once again the unity of all things. How are we doing with that unity? Maybe not so well sometimes. It seems like we're divided a lot, doesn't it? We can't watch the same news channels because they'll enrage us or they'll make us mad. So one group of us watches one news channel and another group watches another news channel. And we get further and further divided. We can't post anything on Facebook without raising a ruckus. Seems like our communities sometimes are divided over issues of policy and direction. And in the midst of that, Ephesians says all of that division, all of that division is an illusion. It's not real. What's real is unity. The gathering up of all into God's plan. That's what's real. And so in the first half of Ephesians, the first three chapters, we see the writer of Ephesians praising and thanking God for the plan of salvation that has united all things in Christ. That's the reality, that all things are united in Christ. And then when we get to our passage, beginning with the fourth chapter, 
we as those who are heirs of that unity and participants in that unity are invited to live united with others. We are invited to persevere in the social and personal dimensions of the gospel, to live as if we are one with all of creation. The word that you hear over and over again in Ephesians, well, there's a couple of them. There's a bunch of them, actually. Unity, reconciliation, and mystery are three that come to mind. But the focus on reconciliation, the reconciliation of all creation to God's plan through the ministry of Christ, the focus on reconciliation denies and destroys the importance of human distinctions and divisions. They're not real. We can pretend like they are. We can pretend like our divisions are real, but they're not real. What's real is the unity of God's plan and purpose. So if we live as if all things are one, how do we embody that? One thing I was thinking about as I was spending time in Sacramento, a place that I have been uh, a, a part of, it's been a part of my life since before I could walk, as it turns out. My parents informed me as I grew older is the permanence and the power of nature. I remember going to that place when I was just a junior high youth. And you know, the mountains are in exactly the same place. There's still a rainbow that comes up in the afternoon after the rain. The point of silence where you look out over that Penasco Valley is in exactly the same place. God's Creation, compared to human effort, is permanent and unchanging. So how do we look upon nature around us and see the permanence and the unity of God's plan? Our human efforts seem so short-sighted when we compare them to the power and the permanence of nature. Farmers know this better than anybody, don't they? The brief time that I was a pastor in a farming community, I learned that, the kind of patience that comes from being a partner with nature. And remember, God is always, the farmers would tell you, God is always the senior partner. And then nature comes next, and we're just working. So how do we see the permanence of God's plan when we experience nature in whatever way we can? How do we understand, in addition to that, how do we understand the unity of our experience and our relationship with other human beings? How can we bring unity to our experience? One thing that's been very, very important to me across the years and I've missed this over the last year, as so many of us have, is, is holy conversation. John Wesley used to talk about the importance of holy conversation. Let's talk about what that might look like. For many of us, there were times in my life, I can't, in, in my life, maybe in your life as well, I can't quite do it the way I did many, many years ago when I was pastor in Portales, and I would meet a friend every morning for coffee and every morning for coffee and two donuts. I can't do the two donuts anymore. I can still do the. I'm, I'm down to a diet of one donut a week. That's my, that's my limit. But we would spend time together talking about the state of our spiritual lives. For so many of us, so many of us, it's become 
uh, important that we participate in, in, in the Emmaus Reunion Group. The purpose of the Emmaus Reunion Group is not to shoot the breeze. The purpose of our getting together and drinking coffee is not to shoot the breeze. We did a little bit of that, talk about sports and what have you. But really the purpose is to ask three questions. What does our experience in this past week, what does it say about God? First of all, what does it say about humanity? Secondly, and lastly, what does it say about the relationship between the two? The importance of human of human contact, of holy conversation. And again, so many of us have missed that in the last year. I'm seeking that out now. I have a couple of friends that I have, after being apart basically for a year, that we're getting back together again and sitting down at least once every other week. We're going to work it up to once a week, I hope, where we just spend time in holy conversation. Then we begin to develop the skills of empathy and compassion and sensitivity to the experiences and the needs of others. And then we can extrapolate that outward to those around us. How do we create a sense of unity? I think the difficult experiences in our lives, the tragedies, can be opportunities for us to open our hearts to those who are struggling as well. I'm going to tell you a quick story. There was a man born in the 1880s named Leonis Cheney, late 1880s. He was born in Colorado Springs, Colorado. His family had been uh, founders, uh, longtime founders and residents of Colorado. His grandfather had been a, a, a representative uh, in the state uh, legislature. His grandfather was also the founding director of the Colorado School for the Education of Mutes. That's what they called it in those days. We use a different kind of politically correct language for that now. The Colorado School for the Education of Mutes was founded in the 1870s. And now it's known as the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. It's in Colorado Springs. It so happens that this Leonis Cheney, who later became known, but you've heard this name, later became known as Lon Cheney, was raised by two parents who were completely and profoundly deaf. Uh, and because of that, Lon Cheney became skilled in relating his emotions through pantomime and through facial expression. But he became skilled in something else as well, growing up in the presence of many deaf, mute individuals. He became skilled in the heart skills of empathy and compassion for those who live on the margins of society, who are isolated by society, who are set apart because they're different from the rest of us. Lon Chini came to know what it was like to be set apart. And because of that, he learned to have compassion for those who were different. 
Lon Chaney began his career in vaudeville on stage. And he had a particular uh, skill at sharing a range of emotions with his facial expressions and with his bodily actions to where he very seldom had to say any words at all to convey the meaning of what he was about. And who would be better suited than Lon Chaney for a career in silent movies? Silent movies. And so Lon Chaney went to Hollywood and became a star among the very first stars of the movies and became known as the man of a thousand faces. Launching. But that openness about those who were different, who were marginalized, who were demeaned, served him throughout his career, in which he not only made a living, but he made a life. He made a movie in, the, in 1928 called Laugh, Clown, Laugh. I've seen the movie. If you ever get a chance to see it on Turner Classic Movies, it's a silent movie or wherever you see it, uh, I recommend it. His co-star was a young child star at the time, I know you know this man, named Loretta Young. Loretta was only 14 years old. And to be a child star in those days in Hollywood, I think, was just another word for child abuse in many ways. Read the stories of Mickey Rooney or Elizabeth Taylor or any of those, of the experiences they went through. But Lon Chaney soon discovered that the director of the movie, Laugh, Clown, Laugh, while he was always deferential and polite to Cheney when he was on the stage or when they were filming him, because Cheney was the star, he would change, the director's mood would change radically whenever Lon Cheney left the stage. And the director was verbally abusive and harangued the girl actor Loretta Young. When Cheney discovered this, he would make it a point to never leave the stage when Loretta Young was there. And he said at the director's right hand, of course, never said a word, 